Visionaries is proud to present its 20th season on public television. Sometimes you read the paper and watch the news and it seems like there's more bad news than good in the world. But you know what? It's just not true. I at least can hold on to something, that there's something, maybe it's small, but there's something that I'm doing to make a difference. It's just a feeling that you have. You can help people. You have to. There's no alternative. Every child has potential that we just can't know. And so to my mind, that's what we're doing. We are saving potential for the future. Disability Rights International is the first human rights organization to bring attention to the millions of people with disabilities locked away in orphanages, psychiatric wards, and other facilities. They have done this by conducting investigations in more than three dozen countries. In recent years, Disability Rights International staff have found children tied to their beds and denied medical care babies rocking back and forth and gouging their eyes because of mind-numbing boredom and neglect. The saddest part of the story is many of these children placed in orphanages actually have family. That is why DRI has launched a worldwide campaign to end the institutionalization of children. The campaign's goal is to educate governments as well as charities and international donors to support community integration for all children. In this episode of The Visionaries, we'll travel to the Republic of Georgia, where DRI is following up on a report it released in 2013, following a three-year investigation in that country. said that he never gets out of his crib. Does he get outside at all? And what does he do during the day? Sometimes he sit in another room. Sometimes he lay in bed, sleep eat. So he's five years old. Mostly he stays in the bed or he sits in a chair and he sleeps and eats and that's his life. Okay. Five years old. We were particularly interested in Georgia in part because we knew it had received an enormous amount of U.S. government aid. After its war with Russia, it got a billion dollars in foreign aid. We wanted to see how that money was being used. The report found that, laudably, the government had made a move to close down its orphanages. Unfortunately, they said, well, we'll come back for the kids with disabilities later. Non-disabled kids got into the community. Disabled kids were left behind. Children without disabilities were prioritized, uh, but children with disabilities uh, still remain in institutions. It's abusive enough to be away from family and being locked in an orphanage, but then all the uh, other abuses that we find, it's just, uh, it's just so inhumane. It shouldn't happen. It doesn't need to happen.
people assume that in poor developing societies, the only way to help people is, well, let's build an orphanage. There are no staff in here at all. I've just been wandering through a couple rooms. Hello, hello. Hey. How are you? Hey. How are you? But in practice, what we have seen is that it ends up perpetuating segregation. Behind the closed doors of institutions, people with disabilities languish. They're still essentially left to die. <clears throat> to my mind, I believe it is the greatest human rights violation going on in the world today. It is a vast, vast population, at least 10 million children. We see in institutions a lot of disability that looks terrible. I mean, people rocking back and forth. We even see self-abuse. Kids hitting themselves in the face. When you look at that, you think, my God, they must be so disabled. The psychologists have shown that a lot of that disability can be caused by the institutions. When you are so emotionally neglected, a lot of the self-abuse is just the expression of the pain that you feel to just lay in a crib. It's pretty much a death sentence. Things happen to your body. You aspirate food into your lungs. Your lungs collapse from the pressure of being laid down all the time. First time we went to the Tbilisi Infants House, what we saw was just shocking little kids in cribs with heads that had ballooned, had so expanded because the accumulation of water on the brain, essentially. This child has hydrocephaly, and um, if he had been provided care early in life, the hydrocephaly could have almost certainly been entirely avoided, and he would have probably had little or no disability, would have lived a normal life. Doctors in Georgia were making life and death decisions, and in this case, mostly death decisions. And we saw some babies with heads the size of a basketball, and they were in horrible pain. We already have three cases where diagnostic and interventions were provided in appropriate timeline, and I'm very hopeful that, that three kids and in future more would grow normally and their life quality and life expectancy would be the same as other health kids. Where you can see some children with Down syndrome like a hundred dysplasia, and the system a new case. This boy is significant because he's one of the first children to benefit from the uh, government of Georgia's new guidelines to provide immediate and appropriate medical care to children with hydrocephalus. And, you know, when I first came to Georgia three years ago, I visited the Tbilisi Infant House and I found rows and rows of cribs of children like Georgi, and we'd come back every six months, and there would be another empty crib from another child who had died, who did not need to. It's powerful, you know, and it really makes me happy to be able to do what I do, and it's just uh, encouragement to, to keep on. To see a person whose life you know you had saved, I mean, that is, that's an incredible experience. It was very gratifying, really, to see that little beautiful child alive and knowing that we were saving those lives.
I started out interested in mental health issues. And when I volunteered to work in a psychiatric hospital in the United States, I found it a dehumanizing experience. And I decided, well, I'm going to go off to Israel and join the peace movement. And really became exposed to how when individual rights are abused, everything else falls by the wayside. I decided to return to the United States and go to law school. I was in a human rights class and uh, Professor Juan Mendez, who's uh, an amazing Argentine human rights activist, came up to me during class and said, I hear you have a mental health background. It would be really valuable if you were to write your term paper on human rights issues in the mental health context. I was amazed that there was absolutely nothing in the literature on international human rights in this area. When you did a search, you came across the stories of the political dissidents in the Soviet psychiatric hospitals. But the shocking thing was that Amnesty International would write their report about the one political dissident in this hospital, and it was as if a thousand other people, well, they're mentally ill, so they're supposed to be there. So that first paper that Juan Mendez asked me to do in law school turned out to be kind of the legal framework for the next 20 years of my career. The very first investigation I ever did was in Ukraine. Then I went to Uruguay, Mexico, and we started publishing reports on this and just bringing world attention to the unbelievably serious abuses that exist in psychiatric hospitals, nursing homes, orphanages. Our first real breakthrough came in the report that we did on Mexico. Overnight, this issue exploded. Maybe one of the more unexpected outcomes, but something that we had been arguing for for years, but never expected it to happen, was that after the government of Mexico was embarrassed, they went to the United Nations and they put forth a resolution to draft a new UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. We are on the road to the Markopi Institution, which is at about an hour outside of Tbilisi. At this facility, um, these are people who have been brought here from uh, kids who grew up in the orphanages and aged out. There really is nothing. There's no way that these people could be integrated into society in the sense that, as you see from the road here, um, they're out of sight and out of mind. There are about 75 young adults in this facility. It's a range of disabilities, intellectual disabilities, psychiatric disabilities, mobility impairments. And then there are some people who have no apparent disability. And what you can see is the impact of having grown up in an institution without the emotional connections to family, the experience of living in the community. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, Gamajobat. Gamajobat. Hey, nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Hey, yes. how are you doing? Hello. 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 Uh, good to see you. Come How are you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. Hey. Hello.
It's uh, about four o'clock in the afternoon. We saw some of the people sitting outside, but you know, this guy is sitting in bed with his sheets up over him. Do they know how old he is? From oh, 18. He's 18. He was in one of the orphanages for children with disabilities. Yeah. And he, he became 18, so they transferred him here. Did I just see him hit himself? Yeah. Yeah. So he's self abusive a little bit. If you had a place to live near your son, would that be nice to be able to live nearby? Yes, I, and okay. I want to live in my son. Near your son, okay. Yeah. And um, are you able to go out and visit your son? Yes. She has no legal yes. right to make yes. decisions yes. for herself. Yes. So yes. she's not allowed to leave here. I see. But well, we see one, two, three, four, five, six beds, no decoration, no personal possessions. There is one closet here, but even that has just got blankets and pillows, absolutely nothing personal. Okay, see you next time. Bye. Oh, God, that's heartbreaking every time. What gets to me, which I think is one of the hardest things to get across when you're writing a report or telling somebody about the abuses in institutions is how abusive it can be to just uh, live in an empty box with nothing to do, the mind-numbing boredom that is their lives. And it's not because they're tied down to cribs or, or, or uh, many of the other very visible abuses that we see in many other places. It's because there's nothing for them in this place and they're separated from their families, from their loved ones. They have lost hope in a lot of cases. And it's, it's heartbreaking for me because it's so clear that they have so much potential and they're so I I intelligent and in, 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 in touch with what they want out of their lives, but no one is listening to them. Well, thank you for talking with me. Okay, good luck. The effort here is not to improve this facility, it's to close it down. Governments need to provide housing, they need to provide support to families, they need to change their laws, but that happens because citizens demand it to happen. Our role is to empower those citizens. You need a mechanism to where civil society can yes. go in and do independent monitoring. Yes, because Mm -hmm. I know that there is something going on there quite severe. And children are asking for help. Eric Rosenthal and Eric Matthews were the first person to tell me, hey, Anna, this is not okay that these people are like that. This is the norm. This is just what happens to kids. Yeah. Tough luck. Yeah. We have to connect with the Disability Rights International in order that ourselves get stronger. <laughs> There were times when I felt really lonely and ho hopeless, and in this very moment, I, I have contacted Disability Rights International, which totally changed my state of helplessness, because I felt I'm not alone here, even when I'm one, or even when we're three persons. No matter how disabled you are, love and attachment and having a family matters. When you've got families who are willing to love up a kid, and that's a universal, that's what you need to bring about change. It's just heartwarming to see this happen. And I've seen it in country after country after country. And it doesn't matter whether you've got resources or no resources, Every country has families 
the solutions are so easy. I'm sorry, Jim Tanner, that's Horus, Meole, Jimmy, Kalish Willy, Jimmy Orish Willow Billy, the Pijuna Romelis Vishwila official. Mari Trentaro de Sats Moida, tell him better I said it better a bus to Sat Mevicon de Tavze. It was so, so little. Trentan Mog Anishendek, um, Talia did the progress to change the motor pausch. Helit was Arab to make Weba Mog Weba, still of Tavis Helit Jamos, was a little Tavis Helit Jamas, still of Sesgag etus. Ragat dilis procedure bi pirs tavis silus tavis xeli taibano spiri. Chemi sa kutari shuli mas kardas shuli pir veli shuli pichim. Mas shi old vi sambosh sheta. Misi twale vi misi mimi kemi. Mebi ela peri absoliturat. Ta kadat skute to oficialurat kesh shuli pina. Mi bichi sa xeli da kuari. Zali anu kuar sim gera. Ia ona nas kareshi Arab fritar da izinebs. Khde ba iserum sak mi anu bghamit sak mi sraga tas movit ove. Iti zali anu iti tiam ola pers. Shuli unda izerde bodes te dasan. Ojak shunda os pa shubi. Mere ra romis o shes guduli shes azalu bisaris. Mere ra romis eni daun e biarie. Mere ra ufal ma rogurit ki bodes iseti mihe. Ta iseti agiare. Ar unda shes inde tam problemis. Pirikit. اون داشت زل نام ولی پس من تله سیگار دستیگانی تکان کلاه با رام دیسات گازتیم آم باشی بیست میمارت سیت بود آش چرمت کی برونه به نس باشی بی تکن میل تارم هیچ گیت رگوری بد نیاری بان اس نی روم مپری بیار مخ بیان اما زدیدی بد نیاری برا آریس آرا پری she is like a family child. No one will say, I think, that she lived in the institution. She's so lovely. She's a pretty girl. There are more children waiting. Maybe they are not dying next day, but they are gradually disappearing. Okay. Their personality is disappearing and their life is getting smaller and smaller. I know that they are waiting for us. I really know that. You know, we can't save the world. I wish we could, honestly. I know that every single person in an institution that I've seen in the last, say, 10 years, I'm not going to be able to get them out. But with children, there's a whole new generation waiting to be born behind the children that are in there now. I'd like to see the day when there aren't any orphanages built. We can see from kids like Georgi that change can happen, and so it's just really encouraging to keep on keeping on. Gloria and Eric, don't stop with the report. It's not over until the kids come out out and are in homes and are in appropriate conditions with someone to love them. How long a fight this is, I don't know, but A, it is a fight that can be won and it is a fight that's worth engaging in. This is, um, in Georgian, this is Partnership for Human Rights. And in the back, it's a quote from Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, this is the only thing that has ever did. Good to see you.
DRI recently obtained funding from the United States government to help Georgia get children out of orphanages and into homes in the community. DRI activists say the work in Georgia could be a model for change and can demonstrate that all children with or without disabilities can have a good life in the community. Next week in part two of our special on Disability Rights International, the visionaries will travel to Mexico, where DRI first brought the human rights of people with disabilities to world attention. For the visionaries, I'm Sam Waterston. Visionaries is brought to you through the generosity of Nick Candy and Holly Valance, Conrad Clausen, Akuma, Jeff and Mary Madura, International Raw Materials, Lockheed Martin, Wilma Harris in memory of her parents August and Martha Ubell, Howard and Maxine Lewis, Foundation for the New York United Hospital Medical Center in memory of Ryan Mahoney, First Metro Bank, Pelagro, San Antonio Friends, Mr. William Ingley and Ms. Jane Madden, Bank of America, Fertilizer Industry Roundtable, the A.J. Sackett & Sons Company, and the following.